Glenn, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you. Take a look at the trends with me, the trends that are shaping the growth of metro regions such as Atlanta. Well, growth is the number one trend in, in this region. And the question is, how, does, how is that managed and what happens to it in the future? And there are several different forces which are going to push in different directions. One is climate change or global warming, which is quite clearly happening now and is going to lead to more variable weather so far as we can tell. And it looks like that's going to come sooner and harder than scientists used to think. And so that the drought that Atlanta experiences right now may not be a once in a generation or a once in a lifetime event. It may be something that comes from time to time. And that requires us to think much smarter about how we do development. That's number one. Uh, number two is increasing energy prices, namely the end of cheap oil. And we all see what's happening to the price of oil right now, which then raises challenges for a region that is so heavily dependent on automobile-based development. So we have to think differently about how we build our community, not just about transportation mm -hmm. systems, but literally about how we think about housing and work and, and recreation and how all of that fits together. And then there's a third force, which is hitting the whole country. It hits Atlanta as well, and that's the aging of the population. So that if you go out 20 years, you've doubled your mm -hmm. aged population. You go out beyond that, and then you get into an even older population. People want to stay here rather than move somewhere else as they age. And then that raises questions about, especially about housing mm -hmm. and how to provide housing choices that are affordable to people who are over 65 and have limited income. And then it also raises questions around transportation because a heavily spread out automobile dependent mm -hmm. transportation system doesn't work so well for uh, a population in which at least 20%, eventually a quarter of the population, are really not needing to drive all that much and would like to live in a more compact community mm -hmm. form. Not needing and in some cases not able. Well, it's surprising. If you ask people uh, what how they would like to get around, they'll say, well, I'd like to drive. Uh, but uh, it's something around 20% of people who are over 65 now in the U.S. don't drive anymore. It's actually a quite surprising number. I don't really understand how they manage to get around because most communities have very little transit. Uh, and so they must, be, they must be awfully stuck. I would assume their next choice would, or their thought would be, I'll have somebody drive me, my the, daughter, my son. There, my is, there is that. And uh, as, as somebody mentioned to me the other day, I wonder mm -hmm. if they've asked their daughter or their son how that's going to work out. <laughs> it's difficult. Because, because every, you know, people are busy, and it's, it's much harder than you'd imagine. My mother, who's age 87, lives by herself in Portland in the house that she's been in for mm -hmm. 40 years. And um, she had a slight stroke. She couldn't drive for about six months. All the kids live elsewhere. She was really stuck. Really? for about six months, still insists on living in the house uh, and got a driver's uh -huh. license back and so on. But that's, that's going to become not sort of an unusual, eccentric kind of story to tell. It would be happening everywhere. And so that's the third force, this aging of the population that I think really just stands out along with energy and along with climate change. Climate change. Be specific when you, when you envision an appropriate public transit system for seniors, what does it entail? Is it, is, it an, is it a bus that's easier to board? I mean, sometimes when the bus pulls up and there's a gap between the curb and the step, I mean, literally, the 85-year-old is going to struggle. Right, so right. So be specific Well, about it, it, it involves, in my mind, three things. One is, if I could wave a magic wand over this region or just about any region, but this one in particular, so that's 50 years from now, so there's some lead time to get there, there is a lot more, uh, and, you know, transportation people debate this, a lot more train-based transportation because it's so energy efficient. And it also has an aura of, uh, of kind of safety and modernness about it that people like. So I would extend the web of train-based transportation that you already have here. The second thing is uh, obviously bus transportation mm -hmm. uh, and the kinds of accommodations for people who are less physically able, I, I think, would be important there. And then the third is much more um, individualized mass transportation. And what I mean by that is it's probably small vehicles, in some cases very small vehicles, mm -hmm. that are circulating constantly and providing transportation. Here's a little science fiction type scenario. Sure. Uh, it's 2030 in the Atlanta area and, and the streets have a fleet of uh, self-driving vehicles. You know, the, uh, the, 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 the Defense Research Agency called DARPA just this last weekend was having their first test of robotic vehicles driving through city streets. Uh, 
If you go are out they large, small? No, they're, they're, they're full size. They're, okay. they're today's vehicles retrofitted with steering systems and computing systems and so on so that they can navigate on their own. Not, not by somebody with a joystick, but literally with their own intelligence built in and their own vision systems and so on. Much like the car you, that's come out that self-parks? Correct. Self-parallel yeah, parks? Yeah, exactly, okay. exactly like that. So if you jump 25 years ahead mm -hmm. and you assume the advances in information technology that are quite clearly going to happen, then it's possible to start thinking about a train-based system, a, um, a bus-based system, which can carry lots of people in a very energy efficient, and then probably uh, electric uh, self-driving vehicles, literally that circulate the streets and provide individualized transportation. That's a little bit science fiction-y, and it's a little bit off the, uh, out, let's call it outside the box of how we usually think about it. But if you, one of the advantages, by the way, of this 50 forward program, the reason I love it uh, is that when you think more than 10 years ahead, mm -hmm. You're allowed to think differently. Don't if you, you ask, because you have to, because you assume that things mm -hmm. are not only going to be different, they can be different, and they can be radically different. Mm -hmm. If you only think five or ten years ahead, a typical planning horizon, you're so stuck with what you have that you can only make incremental changes in your vision. Mm -hmm. But if you think 50 years ahead, you can say, you know, we could really do something differently if we had enough lead time. Now you do. Think about the senior population, and, and I was fortunate enough to hear your speech. What is it, other than living in their home as long as they possibly can, that they want? In other words, if they, if they can't live in their home or they're deciding for the future, where do they want to be? Do they want to be in town? Do they want to be out of town? Do they want to be near the medical center? Do they want to be near the grandkids, wherever that is? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the thing that they most want to be near are family and friends. That's, that's most standard. I mean, there are exceptions to that who say, no, we're going to move to sunshine. The kids can come and find us. But the majority of people say, I would like to be near my family and friends, and that's a driver. Uh, the challenge that we have is there are not a lot of housing choices that are being built yet. And we make a little mistake in thinking about these future housing choices for elders. That is, we, we think, well, they're in their home now. At some point, they have to leave their home, and then they move to a retirement home or even a continuing care retirement community. We need a certain number of those, but listen carefully. In 2025, the baby boom generation, which is this big age wave, in 2025, the baby boomers will be aged 61 to 79. So almost none of them, and the average age of somebody going into a, uh, a retirement home that we would think of as skilled nursing is age 86. And so baby boomers won't be anywhere near that kind of housing in 2025 but they won't want to be in their 5,000 square foot house with one or two people in it. And a large yard. And a large yard and all that other stuff that, that, that goes with it. Uh, and, but they don't, we just really don't have very many choices, particularly that are affordable. Here's a challenge that I'm giving to people in the construction and housing industry. I think if you look at 55 million more aged people between now and 2025, which is what the number is, maybe more, that means it's probably a national market, and who knows what it would be here in this area, for 10 million, 15 million homes that are half the size and half the cost of the typical new home that's built today. Uh, high tech, very modern, mm -hmm. lots of, uh, uh, let's say, sophisticated facility for somebody who's aged, rocker lights, simple things like rocker light switches mm -hmm. and wide hallways and ramps and so on, mm -hmm. all, all the kind of stuff. But we have to figure out how to do lots of them and, and do them less expensively than the way we build housing today. Uh, and that's an opportunity in the greater Atlanta region as well. Atlanta is slightly younger than the rest of the country. There are parts of the country where you'll have a quarter of the population already by 2020. Who are in and the are you bracket. seeing some of these developments that are very successful? Uh, Not very, very few, very few. What you do see are some uh, kind of livable communities in older downtowns or in former industrial areas that can be redeveloped into what, you know, what we typically call mixed use with, with some housing and some retail and some jobs. By the way, most of those people, a surprising number, uh, will still be working. They won't be working We're going full. to need them to work. We're going to need them to work, but also their income requirements are going to be such that they have to work. They haven't certain, planned well enough? Well, they haven't planned well enough, but in 1980, 79% of the U.S. population had a fixed pension plan. We're down to less than 20% who have a fixed pension plan, and we're depending on people to save for themselves, and not enough people are going to do it. And so there's going to be more people who need to be in the paid labor force than, uh, than we think of. And it'll be more like it was in 1950 when in 1950, half of men age 70 were still in the paid labor force. In 1950, it'll be more a world like that. 
Now, they won't want to work full time, but they might want to work from home. They'll be information technology uh, sophisticated. Sure. They'll have worked with IT all of their lives. So they can do things using, uh, you know, very smart communication uh, sure. systems. Uh, and they'll like to walk. The other thing that we really have to do is, uh, is think about walkable communities. Well, uh, Atlanta is fascinating in, in this sense, particularly suburban developments, which are very typical. And, and that is you, you drive into them and there's no place to walk. There's not a sidewalk to be seen. And we did it to save a few hundred dollars. That's what we did it for. Uh, and we're going to spend 50 years going back everywhere and building sidewalks because it's the only way for people to get around. And it's not only healthy, it's, it's more convenient. And, and, and that's, that's one of the things that we're going to be doing. Tell me about the trends when it comes to digital technology and how advancements in digital technology are really going to impact the way we govern, how our government functions. Yeah. Okay. Well, you have to think about digital technology in, uh, in, from two angles. Number one, the technolo technology side. And we are going to enable people to have higher bandwidth, faster communications. More and more people have that until everybody has it. Uh, and that means we're capable of communicating in real time, in three dimensions, as though you and I are in the same room 20 years from now. And that becomes a very common communication tool. And people then will expect it. So on the technology side, we just know that, that it's coming, and if you are providing any service, including a government service, you have to provide that through a digital means as well as in person. The second th side uh, for looking at it is the generational side, because the generation that's coming into the workforce now is the first of the digital natives. Totally is, savvy. Yeah, totally <laughs> savvy. Well, they're, they're, they're the kids. You know, yeah. It's a self-explanatory term. They're the kids who have grown up since computers. So that's that generation is considered to have begun about 1982. And so the oldest of them have been lived with computers all their lives. The youngest of them have lived with the internet all their lives. Time shift maybe 12 years out or 15 years out. They're dominant players in the, work, in the workforce uh, and just as citizens. And if you're not doing something via the net, if you're not doing th something through telecommunications, they just don't understand. Uh, I'll tell you. It's I, like I, plugging into the wrong outlet. It, 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 there's, I have a great quick story. Uh, the company, uh, Hewlett Packard, has a uh, video conferencing system called Halo. And Halo uses a fiber optic network around the world. And, uh, and I, was, I was in the room. Uh, and when you turn it on, uh, there's a glass wall here that's a screen. But because it's fiber optic, it would be, you could be in Boise and I could be here, and it would be as though we're right here. I see you in full high definition, and it would just look like I'm, there, there's kind of this little window in, in between us. But otherwise, we're here, and there's no time lag. It's the most amazing thing. It well, sounds they, very cool. <laughs> they, they, they created, so, so they created some software tools that people can use using uh, a, a keyboard and, and mice and so on to control different aspects of this. And in one corner, they put the symbol of a telephone, but the telephone is the old kind of the, the handle that would have been on an old black tabletop mm -hmm. telephone. And when they brought digital natives in the room, they didn't know what it was. <laughs> they thought it would be so intuitive that if you wanted to telephone the person, you would pick the telephone. They didn't know what that thing was. <laughs> well, you keep, keep going in that direction. They're going to be much more sophisticated in terms of digital technology, and therefore we have to provide uh, every, every kind of service to them let's call it through the Google, Googleization of the world. All right. As a futurist, picture a mid-century metropolitan area, Atlanta. Mm -hmm. What are we doing well, and what might we be missing? Well, if you're talking ideally, what mm -hmm. you would have done well is starting about now, development would have turned, everybody doing development would have turned at the borders around and started, look, started to look inward instead of outward. We move outward because it's cheap and convenient and we can sell cheaper housing. That is, we can, we can sell nice housing at a cheaper price and so on. But there's going to be a great need for, because of the energy situation, the climate change situation, the elder population situation, for rethinking design and going from the outside in it really is what it's all about. And, that, and there's tremendous opportunity to think creatively about how you do compact community uh, forms, which are very exciting to live in, very fun to live in, very walkable and so on, lots of that. A, a high uh, variety transportation system so that I have lots of choices. 
you know, it's been a mantra, of course, of transportation planners forever, but uh, we'll have to do better with it because an auto-based, particularly gasoline automobile-based system, is going to get more and more expensive. Uh, a young person told me the other day that I think I've bought my last gasoline car because by the time I'm ready to buy my next one in eight or ten years, I'll be afraid to buy one because I don't think I'll ever be able to resell it. Nobody will want to buy it after that. I thought that's a very interesting point. It's true. Yeah, and it makes, it makes a lot of sense. I have an in my driveway, and I thought, how am it, I going to unload this albatross? It makes a lot of sense. <laughs> and, and when that, you know, and I think when that shift comes, it's actually going to come very fast. And we'll look up in five or ten years and we'll say, oh, it's unbelievable. Well, if you look How at the number of cars that used to, the hybrid options, you know, yeah. even five or six years ago yeah. were extremely yeah. limited yeah. compared to what you have today. Yeah, did you watch the end of the All-Star game? The All-Star, or not the All-Star, the World Series yeah. baseball game? Two hybrids given away, away by Chevy. I thought that was an okay. interesting little turning point. I was going to say, and I recently purchased a hybrid within the last year, and I love yeah. it. I love yeah. it, and I feel much better driving it. Yeah. Let's look at uh, what you know about Atlanta, because I know you've studied yeah. the city. Based on your knowledge, what do you think we should be doing if we want to position ourselves as a leader in the United States? Well, the, the development pattern that I suggested, I would, I would set out to become a, a leader in that. I would look at your university system and your higher education system and keep trying to do everything you can to knit them together and to leverage their technology expertise like the Georgia State, uh, or is it Georgia Tech, Georgia, uh, Nan Tech. Georgia Tech Nanotech Center. Because that's, that's going to be... excellent. Yeah, it, it's big, it's growing, it is... Uh, I, I argue probably the most significant of all the technological revolutions because it has the potential to touch so many different things. And one of those that it will touch is uh, solar energy. Uh, and there are companies that are working on uh, nanotechnology solar cells, which just means arranging molecules into solar cells by printing them off of printers like inkjet printers. It's an amazing and cheap, easy way to do it. And, and given the amount of sunshine that you get here 50 years from now, I would set out to be a leader in, uh, in solar energy technology. It's not, on the, it's not on the radar here locally yet, but it ought to be. I would do that. I would keep leveraging the, the diversity. One of the things that we saw in, in the breakfast program for the Atlanta Regional Commission that I was at this morning was uh, the degree to which you're a leader in basically in attracting mm -hmm. Latino immigrants and uh, um, Asian immigrants and so on. And so you're getting a, even a, an ever richer uh, ethnic mix in this region, which leads to if, if if managed well, it leads to lots more creativity, lots more sort of mixing of ideas and perspectives and so on, particularly with the recent immigrant population, you get different ways of looking at things. And uh, you're ahead of the curve and should stay ahead of the curve in trying to keep all of that together. So that, that seems to me to be very important. Uh, and then regional government governance is an issue here because just like everywhere else, you have this great hodgepodge of communities and agencies and boards and districts and so on, and working hard to keep everybody working towards similar, not necessarily identical, but uh, you know, in a similar kind of direction so that we keep all hurting ourselves to, to try to go somewhere together rather than fighting against each other. What about our ability to be a leader when it comes to going green, if you will? Well, I, you ought to try to try to be a leader in that, and, and there are actually lots of good, good local examples of, of companies and of um, communities that are making efforts to go green. And, and there's there's a little misunderstanding about go green uh, that I picked up in some conversations that I, that I had he, while I was here, and and it is this: we think of going green as preserving green space. So doing something which keeps more trees and keeps more grass and, and so on. And that can be part of it, but it's much more about looking at the old downtown, looking at the abandoned industrial district, and figuring out how to do development there that is green in the sense of being very energy efficient, being very efficient in terms of use, use of water, uh, being a very attractive place to live and work and have recreation, and so on. That's what going green is all about, and, and there I think uh, if you begin thinking in those terms, uh, it's, a, it's a great design challenge, it's a great architectural challenge, uh, and given the tendency of this area to look at a problem and to say, okay, we can do that, uh, this is one you ought to do. All right. With that, I say thank you very much. Glenn, You're welcome. It's a pleasure to have you. Th thank mm -hmm. you.